Hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk. I hope you had a good session in the keynotes this morning. And now uh, I'm happy to take you on a journey from the world of cloud native computing to the world of edge computing. And in this journey, we will learn how Kubernetes can be used to control and manage AIoT machine learning pipelines on the edge devices. A little bit about me. I, am, I work as a solutions architect in one of the best teams within Cisco called Emerging Technologies and Incubation. My talk today has two sections. I will first talk about why AIoT, what is important about it, and when we bring AI and ML together, what are the emergent behaviors, uh, what are the patterns that help us solve those behaviors, and I'll also show you a comprehensive reference architecture on how to build an AIoT ML solution along with the reference implementation, and then a live demo. The demo is the most interesting part. I had a lot of fun building all this hardware. I uh, spent many weeks to do it, uh, three hours and you know sleep. But uh, I will share all the journey with you. And this is one of the reasons why I was able to come up with a reference architecture. The lessons learned in the journey of building this demo is what shows up in the reference architecture. So what is, what is AIoT? Uh, we all know and have heard that the number of internet, internet connected devices is, is growing each year. Most industry analysts say that by year, in the next three years, we will have close to 55 billion devices. But that's where we reach a point of diminishing returns. What we find is the more devices we get in the correct internet, the less insights we're getting. And at the same time, we're also seeing that as these devices and they connect to the internet, the cybersecurity attack vectors keep increasing progressively. So what is the solution? The solution lies in looking closely at what do the devices do when, the, when they connect to the internet. Their primary reason to connect to the internet is to push the data to the cloud tier so that we can generate insights and power our business applications. And therein lies the solution. What if that the power of, of making insights and inferences is brought down closer to these embedded devices. But that's easier said than done. Once we do that, there are a lot of problems that arise in, in putting them together. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the emergent behaviors. The first thing that we see is as soon as we start to think about bringing machine learning to edge devices or embedded devices is the computational complexity of running machine learning on embedded or resource-constrained devices, uh, it is a big challenge. Most machine learning frameworks are just too bulky to run on embedded devices. And we also see that there are insufficient metrics to measure the performance uh, of a machine learning algorithm. The traditional flops or max uh, are very generic. Uh, you know, when you, when you go to a particular, let's say, a TPU accelerator or a GPU device, uh, from a particular vendor, uh, you see those metrics uh, are just too coarse grain. They lack the fidelity to, to measure performance. Uh, the performance, and measuring performance is key because these devices have limited power, bandwidth, computational uh, resources. And we also find is as, as machine learning is brought closer to these devices, uh, the optimization strategies that we frequently use on the cloud tier uh, erode the, the training, the, the model accuracy, and that it, it leads overall to degradation of the model. And that's when uh, things around drift detection becomes important uh, when, you, when you do this, when you bring machine learning to the edge. Uh, and I, what, what we'll also see is that there are multiple incompatible computational architectures on the edge tier. Uh, the biggest challenge I had doing this was a lot of the stacks don't work on ARM64. Uh, you, it, it works fine on AMD or x86-based machines, but on ARM it just, just doesn't. And you also see that when you run containerization on ARM-based devices, a lot of things that work in normal container deed uh, does not seem to work on ARM devices. And I'll talk about some of those uh, in, my, uh, in my talk and in the demo.
Okay, my presentation froze. Is it going to the next slide? Give me a second. I think I'm having some problems controlling this. The need some help here. <laughs> I'm good to go now. Sorry about that. Thanks for being patient. OK. Um, so uh, one, of the, one of the key problems that I encountered as building this, this demo and looking at uh, how we can bring machine learning to the edge there was uh, the complexity, as I said, uh, of, of these algorithms. Uh, so uh, let me bring up this complexity chart. So I just I put a, a little table with, with where, I, where I show uh, some of the most commonly used machine learning algorithms. And the one I'm using for this demo is a logistic regression algorithm. So if you look at it closely, what we see is uh, the columns here, the first column, the size shows space complexity, and the training inference is the time complexity of the algorithm. So what you notice here that <clears throat> the training complexity of logistic regression is a polynomial time. But the inference is, is linear. And that's, that's in where <clears throat> lies my primary hypothesis. And through the demo, I will show that. So my hypothesis is 
that the computational power on the edge devices is sufficient to run inferences. But we also have to bring the training down to the edge tier. And to do that, we have to think about the entire machine learning ops pipelines that can run on edge tier. It is not sufficient to run the pipelines on the cloud and then wait the downloads happen on the edge tier. The entire pipeline should be running on the edge tier. And to do that, uh, I uncovered some solution patterns that I'm going to talk about now. Uh, the first and most important pattern here is take the machine learning pipelines, and there's a lot of complex dependencies on the, in the steps in the machine learning pipelines. You express those as DAGs. So there are a few tools, and I'm going to show one of the tools called Argo to express how to express the dependencies as DAGs. Uh, you guys familiar with DAGs? Show of hands. Great. No. I, you're an expert on that. I know that. Uh, uh, and then use the pipelines for yes. Question. Uh, and use the workflow pipelines for continuous evaluation. What I mean by evaluation is major drift and you know and the validations continuously on the edge tier, and then train the models and produce the actual models on the edge tier. And then use. And this is the, one of the very interesting uh, things that I found is, and that's what Kubernetes is, 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 is really helpful, is use hardware accelerator aware pod placement strategies. What I mean by that is using the, the rich expression and syntax in Kubernetes to, to using you know, taints and affinities and anti-affinities and labels. You can basically you know, change the way a particular workload that, let's say, requires a GPU-based acceleration versus a workload that requires a TPU tensor acceleration, you can place them and give the, give the right clues uh, to the scheduler on where to place them. Uh, because in the, in the edge world, uh, not every device is uniform, unlike the cloud world where each VM is you know, the same. Uh, on the edge, we have to be very careful on where things run. And, and some of these libraries are so tied to the hardware that if, if, if Kubernetes places them on a different machine, it just won't work. And some other architectural patterns are uh, containerize the workloads. And, and this is easier said than done. Uh, on, the, on the edge tier, running containers is pretty challenging. And you will see in some, some of the demos and, and the code I'll show you is the IP tables, the basic networking, it's all, it just doesn't work correctly the way it works on, on the cloud tier. Uh, and then another pattern I think is very important is using a streaming API sidecar, and I'll talk about more in, in, in the reference architecture. This allows, the sidecar allows decoupling inference that runs on the edge tier from, from communication. So the sidecar talks to, to Kafka's and NQTTs and you know, all the communication pieces, but you can keep the inference module just focused on doing the inference. It only has the, the, the machine learning libraries in it and nothing else. Uh, and, that, and, and there's a reason for that, because these libraries, as you put more stuff on them, they become very bulky, and you, don't, you, cannot, you won't be able to, to deploy these as containers on these machines. So you need to decouple them. And then automate the orchestration uh, of containers. There are some other embedded ML patterns that I leave on the slide deck, and, and you can read at your leisure later. Uh, Uh, so now, let, let me bring all of this home. Uh, there, is a, there are a lot of moving parts here. So I'm going to talk about a reference architecture. And I spend a lot of time painstakingly putting all these pieces together, because it is comprehensive. It, is, it has a lot of parts. So I'll, I'll take some time to go over it. So this architecture for running AIoT ML ops on the edge tier has four hardware tiers. The first tier is the training tier that runs all the the ML pipelines that, that get the data, extract, validate, train, transform, quantize, and all the good stuff that happens on the training tier. The second tier is the platform tier. This tier is what hosts uh, various services, such as a private container registry, which is important for edge tier, because you just can't be waiting on Docker Hub and you know, Google uh, uh, container registries to download. There is no access to that on the edge tier. Or even if it is, the bandwidth is limited. Uh, then there is an OTA ML code repo. I'll talk more about OTA is over the air. Uh, you know, your phones have a photo when it gets new firmware. On these devices, the edge devices, especially the ones that are in microcontrollers, they don't have file systems, so you can't just download a model. So you have to send the entire firmware. You have to reflash it. So the OTA repo and the services, uh, I wrote a custom repo in Golang to do this, uh, allows you to download it 
to the MCU-based devices and reflash the device. And there are a few pieces uh, that uh, allow us to do uh, protocol bridging. Uh, the the MCU-based, microcontroller-based devices are using MQTT, but the rest of the architecture on the platform tier is all Kafka-based. Uh, so there's a protocol bridge and various other services. The third tier is the inference and the IoT tier. Actually, if you look at this, uh, the folks on, on uh, virtually connected, uh, you won't be able to see it, but I'll show you a picture of what's set up here uh, in, in front of the stage. You'll also th see these tiers uh, on, this, on this demo uh, board here. Uh, the inference in the IoT tier uh, has two class of devices. The first class is the Linux ARM-based devices. So these are the dev kits that are commonly used, are NVIDIA Jetson Nanos, Raspberry Pis, Google, to Google Coral TPUs. So they run Linux or some distro of Linux, and the CPU is, architecture is primarily ARM-based. So you can run most of the stuff that we are familiar with in the world of cloud computing here. So with, with the right containerization and the right uh, stripping down of some, some, some platforms, they do work. Uh, the second class of devices is where things get interested. Uh, and these are the Arto super loop-based devices. Do folks know about, do you guys know about Arto's? Uh, Arto stands for real-time operating system. That's what a lot of embedded devices run. Super loops, if you are familiar with Arduino programming, there's a big setup and a loop that runs forever. That's a super loop device. And these devices are extremely small. They don't have file systems and you know gigabytes of, of memory. Uh, they need special attention. And the architecture and the, and the reference uh, solution I'll show you uh, addresses those concerns. Uh, these devices run inference modules embedded. And these inference modules then communicate uh, over MQTT uh, to the rest of the system. The analog tier is what you see on, on the extreme left-hand side. That's where I have an induction motor connected with a bunch of sensors uh, that takes the analog world, digitizes it, and runs some digital signal processing to filter out inconsequential data or noise. Uh, and I'll also show you how, how, can you, how you can run inferences, machine learning, to filter out noise in addition to DSP. Uh, and then, the, so these are the four tiers. Now there are layers of services that span these tiers. So the first tier, the first layer is the message broker. This is an MQTT-based broker. Uh, and then there are RTOS and Superloop, Superloop OTAs. This allows us to download new firmware as a new model shows up. Uh, and then there are three other layers. Uh, the first at the bottom most layer is the, the event streaming broker. Uh, the next layer is the container management that spans all these tiers. And what brings and controls and uh, you know, configures all the pipelines together is an MLOps workflow pipeline management. So that, folks, is the reference architecture. I know there's a lot going on here. So what, what I'm going to show now is an actual implementation based on this architecture. So I will not implement all the pieces in the, in the reference implementation, but some of the key ones are there. And in the demo, you will also see how it actually happens in the real world. So it's not just in the PowerPoint. Going to get a quick time, quick time check. Thank you. Okay, so here is the reference implementation. Uh, the key tool that I'm using here is is K3S. It is a, a scaled-on version of Kubernetes. Uh, a shout out to Rancher folks. Great product. Uh, it really made my my things easy to do this on on edge devices. Uh, Argo, a great tool again. TF Lite and StreamZ. StreamZ is a Kafka operator that, run the, that runs Kafka on Kubernetes. And it's pretty, pretty lightweight, so I was able to run it on most of the edge devices except a few. Um, so let's, let's take a look at this, this architecture. Um, um, so the, 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 okay, so I have, I'll have to switch again to my main laptop because this is an outdated version of the presentation. I was making some changes this morning, so let me quickly switch. Uh, hold on, folks.
Right. Show you the means. Okay, good. Okay, so back to the reference implementation. Um, as I said, in the reference architecture, there are four tiers. Now, the training tier uh, that you see on the board in front of you is, is running on the NVIDIA Jettison Nano device. Uh, this device turned out to be quite powerful. It has uh, uh, a GPU coprocessor and good amount of computational power. And this uh, device hosts the entire training tier. So the, the ML jobs to extract training data, normalize it, uh, detect drift, uh, train it, and then quantize it. Uh, you guys familiar with quantization, ML folks? So quantization basically is taking the, the big, full uh, frozen graph uh, that comes out of a machine learning tracing training job, and you basically convert it into a format that can run on smaller devices. So quantization you know, changes floating points to integers, and, and uh, the whole process uh, allows us to run uh, the machine learning models on, on small resource-constrained devices. Uh, the platform tier is running on a Raspberry Pi and a VM. I'm using a VM because I ran out of Raspberry Pi, so uh, <laughs> I just couldn't. Uh, it's hard to get hardware these days, all supply chain constraints. So I just couldn't get the right hardware. So uh, the VM here is an, uh, it's an Ubuntu VM, uh, and its OS is very close to the Raspberry Pi. So it was a good drop-in for another Raspberry Pi. Uh, the, the platform tier runs uh, the, uh, the services for the message broker, the, uh, the protocol bridge, uh, the, uh, the, the, the firmware over there, photo services for the MCUs, and a private Docker registry. The inference tier uh, and the IoT tier, as I said, has two class of devices. The first is an MCU-based device. For this demo, I'm using an ESP32S device. Uh, that's what runs an, a real-time operating system, uh, which is hosting a TensorFlow Lite C++ module uh, that uh, talks to the rest of the system over MQTT. Uh, it also has a pre-processing stage, again, using TensorFlow, and a fast Fourier transform to, to filter out noise and you know, remove things that just should not be sent to the, to the rest of the tier. It just increases so much of comp a computation uh, that uh, these devices do not have the capacity to run, to run uh, messages that really have no consequence. So it's better to filter them out closer to the analog tier. Uh, the second class of devices that run uh, Linux uh, on ARM-based hardware is a cluster of three uh, coral dev kits. Uh, these three coral dev kits together will form a cluster, and you will see how load balancing and HA and everything happens on this cluster, uh, again using Kubernetes. Uh, and then the interesting part about this is the, uh, when you see these lines coming uh, towards the, uh, the TFLM module, uh, the way this the works is, as I said earlier, is that as, as this model as there's a new model created in the pipeline, the, the, the FOTA service creates a new firmware binary. And when the, when the MCU gets an MQTT message, it subscribes a message that there is, there is new model, or the model is stale, uh, the MCU reflashes itself uh, with a new model. Uh, on the, on the lix based devices, the model is compressed uh, as a TF Lite file that you can easily download over an HTTPS link. So it's, it's much easier there. The analog tier, again, has an uh, induction motor along with a bunch of sensors uh, that uh, monitor this, uh, this motor for various conditions. And the, the edge, uh, the, the platform services or the layers that span this uh, the, co the concrete implementations for the messaging broker is a mosquito broker that runs on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, there's a Golang custom OTA service. And then for, uh, for the, the Kafka streams, I'm using Streamz. As I said, for Kubernetes, it's K3S. And for the ML workflow pipelines, it's the Argo workflows. OK. Now it's time to, to demo this. Uh, so what? What you see here is this is primarily for the folks connected virtually. 
is, uh, what is what is displayed here on the stage. Um, on the stage, you see the the three tiers for training, platform, and inference that are that have uh, the an NVIDIA device, a Raspberry Pi, a bunch of Coral devices, and a MCU module. And on the far left side is the analog tier, which has the motor, and I have labeled all the key components there. So there is an ESP32 MCU. The primary job of the MCU there is to collect all the sensor data and transmit it over an MQTT message. And then there are a bunch of sensors uh, around uh, this device. So if I... Uh, okay. So I think at this point, before I turn on this, this demo, it, I would like to take you under the hood to see what is actually running on these devices. So the first, I will show you what is running on the Coral TPU device. Uh, and then I'll show you what is running inside the, the MCU device. So what you see here is the, a, a code snippet of the Pi Coral module that is running on a, a, a container managed by Kubernetes on the, on the uh, Pi Coral device. Uh, so on the left-hand side is the actual code snippets. You'll see these libraries, Pi Coral adapters. Now these libraries will work only on an, uh, a device that has a TPU accelerator. Uh, and this is an interesting thing that uh, when I was trying to, to run these libraries on a test device, uh, you know, the, a lot of these silently fail and you don't realize what's going on. So it turns out that there are certain C++, there are C++ modules that load the, the TPU accelerator drivers that work only when it detects a TPU accelerator. And then the rest of the code is to, lo to load the, the TensorFlow Lite libraries, uh, which, anybody here programmed with TensorFlow Lite? No. Uh, yeah, so th this gets really bare bones. Uh, you know, it doesn't have all the nice API and support that you see in, in Keras or other TensorFlow libraries. So you have to just go down to s setting up the input tensors and output tensors, understanding the, the data formats, and then and, and running. Uh, a prediction on it and then getting the output answers. And that's what you see in a lot of the, lot of the code here. On the, uh, on the right hand side is the, the TensorFlow Lite C++ module source code. So this is the, the Python counterpart of TensorFlow Lite that is purpose built to run on, uh, on microcontroller based devices. So all these libraries are here and then again you set up the input answers. Uh, and generally the flow of the code is the same. Uh, and these modules are running on the ESP32 device. Now, the next thing I, I, before I start the demo is to understand the, the Argo workflow pipeline, and that's key to the entire machine learning uh, AIoT pipeline. Uh, as I said, the, uh, the steps of the pipeline to extract, uh, detect, drift, train, and quantize are all running on the NVIDIA device. So let me show you how this is expressed in an Argo DAG. The extract step connects to a Google storage bucket and downloads, downloads training data. And this is raw training data, and it then it transforms and normalizes it. Uh, but if you look at these uh, little rec these rectangles that are showing up here, you are seeing how this step is expressed in an Argo workflow DAG. So the step here is shown as an extract task, but what you see on the far right side with the yellow highlighted box is the corresponding Kubernetes container specifications that then Argo will use to orchestrate and run this container on an edge device. And what you, see, you can also notice that uh, the node selector here is what I'm using to kind of control and, 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 and force a particular uh, workflow step to run on uh, a particular node. Uh, the next step is drift detection. It has a dependency, and that's how you use DAGs. The, it has a dependency on the extract step. That's what you see here expressed in the, in the dependencies section on the DAG. Uh, and the following that is a training step. Training has two dependencies. It requires the extract step to complete and the, the drift detection to be completed. And finally is the quantize step that takes the, the frozen file uh, and then transforms it into a TF Lite module. Here are the four devices uh, that I have used. Uh, okay. 
So now it's time to set up the demo. So the way I was, I'm planning to do it is I, I'll run the demo, I will show you a few things uh, how they work, and then if we have time, because I'm sitting between you and lunch, uh, I, I wanted to show you how to tear this whole thing down and build it from scratch, but I, I, I doubt I'll have time for that. So let me turn on the demo, and we'll see things in action. Uh, now to do that, I will open up This is the view of what is running right now on this cluster. Let me expand this, and this gets really interesting. Uh, let me show you the cluster first. What you see here is the control node is running on a VM. And then you see a bunch of agent nodes. There's a TPU1, TPU2, and TPU3. That's running Coro. Uh, so let me, I think I'll have to share my screen, right? Or can I move it to this? You see it now? Okay. All right, so this is the view of the cluster. Uh, Too big, I think. No, it's good. Good? Okay. So what you see here is a view of the cluster, the edge cluster. Uh, I have the TPU, three TPU nodes, and they're running here. And you can see their IP addresses and their OS images. Uh, there is a, a NVIDIA Jetson and a Raspberry Pi. And this is a view of what parts are running on the cluster. So um, if I had the time, I would have shown you how to build this thing. So you see the Streamsy cluster. This is the Kafka operator running on this uh, cluster. Then you have the Argo server running. This is the, the model registry that lets you down, store downloaded files, the frozen files, the training data, and the, the firmware photo flashes for the, uh, for the devices, for the MCU devices. And the rest of the jobs are basically the workflow DAX that run this pipeline here. Let's see if I can. Let me delete this. And we'll run this again. Uh, uh, I'm using the Argo CLI to submit this tag. As soon as I s submit this, you'll see a pipeline starts. Now, what is happening here is, is it visible? These things are small font. Can't make this bigger. Uh, the extract step just ran. What it did was it downloaded, it, it connected to the uh, Google Cloud Storage bucket and downloaded a training data file. And you can see the container logs here. This is a very good tool. Uh, it shows that model download is complete. The next step is it's running a drift detection uh, job. And if we go back here, you can see the progress of, of these various workflow jobs uh, on, on Kubernetes and KubeCartel. And notice the nodes they're running on. You see this is being scheduled on NVIDIA Jetson. 
and the, the job is complete. Now the training job is running, so let's look at the training logs. And you can see it's dumping some of the internals of what is running on the NVIDIA box. This takes a few seconds to complete. And this is what I, where I, where I found things interesting is that the the NVIDIA Edge device has the power to run this training. Uh, you know, I'm not running too many epochs, and it's not too complex. Uh, but with the right set of uh, hardware and a cluster, it should be able to run these trainings on the Edge tier. And the model you see is says it's uploaded to this model registry. We can open this registry. As I said, this is a custom uh, registry I wrote in Golang. So it, it hosts training data as it's downloaded. Uh, you'll see the model. The model is a zip file. So if I open this zip file, uh, people who are familiar with TensorFlow would see this, the PB files here. And then you have, as the training is running, the next stage is to quantize it. And as the quantize completes, the quantized model will be uploaded here. Let's take a look at what's running on right now. And the pipeline is complete, and now the actual inference modules have been deployed to the cluster. Uh, so let's take a peek into this particular pod and look at its files. And that's where you'll see things in action. As I turn on this, uh, the hardware and the analog tier, you'll see messages flow in me, and you see them in process tier, on the inference tier. So I'm tailing a log file using an SSH command into this container. Hopefully it works. Okay, let me turn on the, the demo now, and we can see this all in action. So I'm going to power on the MCU. And the induction motor. Oops. At some point, we will see the messages flow in. Here you go. So those empty messages are coming in from the device. And let me introduce a, a fault in this motor and see what happens. For that, if the fault is, fall is detected. You'll see this MCU, its LEDs should start, a blue LED should start blinking 15 times, and then it will send a message to the cluster here. So that green light there <laughs> actually is, is showing that an inference job is running on that, that particular node on the cluster. So let me just cut off the power. So something is wrong. And let's see. There. So what, what is happening is it detects a particular a failure on the system, and there is an inference model running there. 
that LED blinked uh, 15 times, and then it sends a message over the uh, over a bridge to the modules there to process the information and to see to actually make inferences on what were the conditions that led to this particular failure. So folks, with that, my demo is complete. I wish I had the time to show you how I built it. Uh, but at this point, let me. Uh, all right, so you see this, this message here is important. You see an inference level two message showed up here. What that means is uh, the way internally I classify inferences is that if the inference is running on the analog tier close to the MCU on the, on the sensors, that is inference level one. That is mostly pre-processing. Inference two is running on another MCU that is running the, the TensorFlow light module that looks at that message and sees if the logistic regression algorithm is detecting a particular condition, only then trans a condition that is above a certain threshold, only then transmit the message to the rest of the tier. So that is inference level two, which means that the, the conditions have been pre-processed and only the signals that have consequence are being sent further up the cluster. So that's the, the, the stage inferences I'm trying to, to show here is. The first level of, of filtering happens on the analog tier using DSPs. The second layer is happening on an MCU. And the third level is happening on the TPU cluster. So that's it. That's, that's my demo. Uh, open to questions now. Awesome, thank you. Yes, we are open to questions. Uh, while we're getting started here, we do have one from the internet. This is great presentation. Where can we get more information about your reference architecture? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, well, I'm planning to, to write, I'm actually in the process of writing a blog, and I will put all of the source code on GitHub. So you will have enough chance to enjoy this, 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 this demo and the source code. Cool. Here, I'll go to the closer one first here, <laughs> sorry. Hey, um, thank you for the demo, it was really interesting. Um, my question is, can you go over a bit um, on the problems that machine learning will help solve um, for IoT devices? Um, yeah. So the question is, uh, Jim, are you repeating the question? If you can repeat it, that'd be great. Okay, so the question is, uh, what, ki what class of problems can machine learning running on the edge solve? It's a good question. Are you foreign? For an IoT engineer like myself, the first problem that I see is closed loop decisions, wherein when the inference or the actual machine learning logic tells you something is wrong, the device can, can actually trigger what's called a closed loop actuation. That means it can tell another set of hardware to intervene or do something. It doesn't have to wait for this information to go up to some back end of the cloud and come back. There's too much latency there. So that, that's, that's number one. The second, it, the second uh, set of of possibility that opens up is, is now being able to keep the data itself on the device. So there are a lot of concerns around privacy and you know attack vectors on the devices connect to the internet. We can resolve that. Any more questions? Yes. Why did you uh, separate the training layer from the, inf or rather, why did you put the training in one device and inference in the other? More specifically, why don't you use the NVIDIA JSON to do both training and inference. Are okay, you running that, those two concurrently? Okay, the question is, uh, why did I separate training from inference? So if you go back to the, the complexity chart I showed you earlier, the computational complexity or the amount of computation required to do training is an order of magnitude higher than inference. So the, the separation ensures that you have the right hardware or the right class of hardware and right class of accelerators to, to power the training computation. But, but the, the, the NVIDIA Jetson, as you said, can not only do the training, but obviously the inference it, as well. Right? It, so it can. So now, when, OK, so I see your question. Uh, uh, the amount of power and network and bandwidth required to run training will be an overkill to run it on the inference tier, because the inference devices are running close to the analog devices and the, and the sensors. Uh, and a lot, lot of those times, those devices are battery powered. Uh, so it makes sure that the inference, the, the, the training jobs do not consume all the power and the computation, and there is nothing left to process the sensor data. But, but if that is indeed the case, but if that is indeed the case, why not just train on a you know, really large GPU on the cloud? You know, it, it, why place even the GPUs? Um, why, why use an edge GPU if you're not going to put it right, right, right. right on the edge? Right? 
Well, uh, it's, it's not. It's not. Like, it's not a thing. I'm just curious to see why why you chose the the architecture. That you as did. I said, you know, the the reason why the 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 training is brought to the edge is so that the the edge can stay in a way decoupled, disconnected from the cloud. So you know, all the areas around privacy, bandwidth uh, latency can be resolved uh, by running these things completely on the edge.